Okay, this is Unit 3, Segment 2, Notes. Um, we were talking about causes for surface currents, and we are on temperature differences. Temperature differences, if you guys remember from the motion in the ocean lab, that created a density difference. So you have warm air rising or warm water rising and cold water sinking. In the ocean, light and heat don't penetrate very deeply, so only the first few meters. Think of that meter stick I have in class. So the temperature drops dramatically with depth, but the rate of decrease is not constant, okay? You have the dramatic drop early on, and then it maintains just a few degrees above freezing in the whole depth of the ocean. There are three temperature layers, distinct layers, that are found in the ocean. And they really only exist in the low latitudes. The upper latitudes are actually pretty uniform in their temperature. So near the equator, mid latitudes, they, are, they, they exist. Top part is the surface zone. And you can see this diagram over here. This is warmed by the sun. The sunlight can pen penetrate through about 100 meters deep. And <clears throat> um, it's very rich in oxygen. And that's because you have churning water. You have wave action happening that's churning and pulling in the oxygen. It's also called, these temperature layers have double names anyway. So you have surface zone and then you have mixed layer and the wind and the water mix the heat pretty evenly so it's an even temp throughout that layer. It is home to millions upon millions of tiny little photosynthetic organisms that are using the sun's energy to convert it to a usable form of energy. So. All marine organisms depend on this, so this is a very important layer for life. At the high latitudes, up near the poles, it extends to about 50 meters, and then in the mid latitudes, it, it goes a little deeper to about 100 meters, and then it does change seasonally, um, especially in the at most in the mid latitudes. And if you think about it, our seasons are much more dramatic here in the mid latitudes than they are close to the equator or near the poles. So it kind of makes sense. Okay, then you go further down and it's the middle zone, also named the thermocline. Very little light penetration comes into this layer. So there's a rapid change in temperature. So on the test or quiz, the, the zone that has the most rapid temperature change is the middle zone. It extends about a thousand meters which if you guys remember surface currents, they extend about that deep too. But anyways, this is middle zone temperature layer. It's also called the thermocline. It's the layer directly beneath the mixed layer or the surface layer and the temperature changes dramatically. The bottom of this layer, this thermocline is roughly, and that's not a negative sign, that's a roughly or an about sign, about five degrees Celsius. And that is going to continue, that temperature will continue all the way through the deep zone. The deep zone, this will be where the abyss is, and there's zero light penetration. It's very, very cold. It's the most dense water, therefore it's the deepest, but it's the one that is at the bottom, type of water that would be at the bottom. Colder water moves away from the polar region, slides across the bottom along the ocean floor. Okay, warm currents, we talked about warm currents coming up. This dotted line is not the equator. It's the 25 degree north line. So your equator is somewhere down in here. And we know that um, because of the Coriolis effect, we have this clockwise movement of the currents. So water comes down here and picks up a bunch of energy and heads to the west side of the ocean basin. So between the west and the east, the west is the warmest. And it delivers some of that heat. Some of that water will transport up and deliver that heat to this area. It's really kind of cool. This is a picture of the Gulf Stream, an, an infrared image. You can see the warmest area here. This is about right there, okay, that we're seeing in this image. And this is the Labrador cold current coming down. Remember, fogs are produced there. So they flow away, warm currents flow away from the equator. They've picked up energy at the equator and they're flowing away. They're along the west side of the ocean basin whether we're talking about the southern hemisphere or the northern hemisphere, no matter what, they're as warm as west, WW. The Gulf Stream becomes, turns into the North Atlantic Drift as it crosses the Atlantic and it delivers that energy here. So the Gulf Stream delivers warm water to Iceland and the British Isles, giving them a warmer climate than without warm currents. 
Cold currents. We have the Canary Current that hits it here, the Humboldt Current, and the Benguela Current. With cold currents, you have cold air above it. Anyway, they flow from the poles. They're flowing down, so we got the clockwise mov movement down here. And they flow along the east side of the ocean basin. And there's a few of the names of some of the currents that are cold. California Current, by the way, is not shown on here. It would be over here, and that's cold in the Pacific. They can collide with the warm, moist air from w that warm currents are bringing, like the Gulf, or um, and they produce very thick fog. Not pictured up here and not diagrammed is the Labrador, the cold Labrador current that swings down and around. So the warm Gulf meets the cold Labrador and produces big th uh, fogs right here. Boundary currents. Um, these these are along the boundaries of the ocean of the ocean basin. Okay, and you can see these thermal images showing warm coming up and around and then delivering that warm here. Um, their western side is warm, currents moving away from the equator. A lot of this is repetitive, you guys. We're just kind of saying the same things over and over, which is fine. The east side is cool. They're moving toward the equator, and there's some names of some of those currents as well. Here's another thermal image of the Gulf Stream. So you can see these little eddies will form. This up here is the Labrador cold, where the two meet, we got fog. Salinity differences. So we just talked about temperature, now let's talk salinity. This is another cause for currents, ocean motion in the ocean. Um, salinity is a measure of the dissolved salts in water. The average salinity of the ocean is at 3.5%. So for every 1,000 milliliters of seawater, there's about 35 grams of salt that are dissolved inside it. Um, it is measured with a conductivity probe. You guys use that probe. There's one shown here. It has a positive and negative, and so a, a, little, a little bit of electricity flows through the fluid, and how well it's received on the other side is a direct measure of the amount of salts or ions that are in the solution. So that's how we measure how salty the, the ocean is. And we have those moored buoys and, and floating buoys that are out constantly measuring the salinity, and so this image right here is showing you the variation in salinities around the world at this moment. Now I wanted to show you this because this is an interesting, this is not a normal percentage, okay? So instead of a 3.5 percent, we've got an extra zero there, so you're seeing a 35 percent, it's not really a percent, but that's what, so you see this sometimes, you see these crazy big numbers in salinity and that's, that's just what it looks like. I just wanted to show you that just so you could see it, an example of that. Now what, what are the salts making up the, the ocean? We all know sodium chloride, like the table salt. That makes up most of it. These are about, these are not negative signs, so it's about 85% sodium chloride, but we also have about 8% sulfate salts, and magnesium salts make up about 4%, and then we have others, like potassium, calcium, and then others make up the last 3%. So we have other things just, um, it's not only sodium chloride. Salinity varies in the ocean. I showed you that diagram. You could see um, the different salinity values around the, the planet, but depth-wise, it varies too. So deeper ocean maintains about a 3.5%, but the surface is a range of 3.3 to 3.7, and you need to know these percentages. Why would the surface have a range in a deep knot? And the answer is because the action is happening at the surface and not in the deep ocean. Action meaning, think of that demo that I showed you guys, or that I will be showing you. Um, you got evaporation, you have precipitation, all of that is happening at the surface and can fluctuate these percentages. So fresh water is less dense than salt water, so it will hang on tops where you have precipitation or where you have rivers or streams draining into the ocean. That water is not, until it mixes evenly, that water will stay on top. And it kind of can disrupt or interrupt any currents or flow patterns that might exist. Um, with an increase in salinity, you have an increase in density. So it will drop down. And this is just a little quiz. I want to see if you guys can get this. So while you're listening to this, I just want you to think in your head what your answer would be. So how does the following events affect ocean salinity? Freshwater runoff, where rivers meet the ocean, what's going to happen? Up or down, up or down? We have a decrease because you have fresh water, you're diluting the salt. It's diluted. Melting glaciers, what's it going to be? 
melting glaciers. Well, when glaciers form, they're fresh water that's frozen ice. When that melts, that's more fresh water. So it's going to dilute it. It's going to decrease it. Precipitation is fresh water, so therefore it will dilute it or decrease the salinity. In hot, dry climates where there's an increase in evaporation versus precipitation, you're going to have a concentration of the salts because fresh water evaporates, leaving the salts behind, so that will increase the salinity in those areas. Near the equator, now near the equator, you're going to have more energy available, so you're going to have an increase in evaporation, but you also have a tendency to have a high precipitation rate near the equator too, but the evaporation winds and usually there is an increase. Freezing ocean water forming the ice. Freezing water is fresh, squeezes the, ice, the salts out, and so around the water around where the ice was formed is going to increase its concentration in um, salt. On here that you cannot see, I refer to the Mediterranean Sea, and I have a bottle of Mediterranean Sea that a student brought back. She was um, from Portage Northern, and she went over to Spain as a foreign exchange student. She brought back Mediterranean Sea. I don't know how she packed it away, but she did. And anyway, it is the Mediterranean Sea is attached to the Atlantic Ocean through um, a channel, but there is it's a shallow channel, and so there's more evaporation rate than than anything and so there's a concentration of salt so super duper salt, salty there in the Mediterranean Sea so you float much easier you're actually less dense than the water around you so it's really easy to float super salty how do this we have a couple more slides left so how do salts enter the ocean Mrs. Colson how in the world underwater volcanoes they release minerals and gases that react with water to form the ions that make up the salt so you have right here is a little venting outgassing Volcano, and that is a source. Also, erosion from rocks, as you see here, can put the salt back in, the ions. And then the marine organisms that take up some of that water, actually, when they die, they decompose, and all those materials go right back into the water. Not to a very big scale, but I can't not list this, is atmosphere. Atmosphere does provide some, especially with sea spray in that area. So, but it's not a, a huge um, contributor. So how does it leave? What you're looking at are diatoms, and these are going to be, in plankton, these are going to be organisms, microscopic, that pick up some of the salt, take it up, and put it in their tissue. And then it can also precipitate out, and you can see with this evaporation, the salt was left behind, so you have these chunks of salt. Um, that's more of an evaporation situation. So all of our salt mines that we have in the area are actually from ancient oceans that have evaporated. But also within the solution, and I have, um, chances are I have a uh, beaker of water, salt water solution, that I've used for demos and stuff for this unit. And you'll see salt precipitate out at the bottom, forming this little layer at the bottom. And that's what that means to precipitate out. It actually comes out of solution, forms a solid at the bottom. And that is it. That's where we're stopping. So you're done with segment two.